We're going to talk about the thermal envelope, talk about insulation. We're going to talk about air sealing, building shell versus thermal envelope. We're going to get into that real deep, talk a little bit more about how insulation works. Then we're going to go into the different types of insulation and how they are installed. We're going to look at our value versus U value. And then we're going to talk about calculating our value. How do you calculate the R value of a wall or of a seal, wall assembly or the ceiling or something like that? First off, let's talk about building shell versus a thermal envelope. So a building shell, okay, that's the primary protection from, from the outdoor elements of a home. If it's raining outside and you're dry, you're inside the building shell. Thermal envelope defines the heating and cooling space, and the thermal envelope also resists thermal transmission and air leakage, assuming that the thermal envelope and the air barrier, the thermal barrier and air barrier are aligned, right? Of air leakage through or within the building shell, okay? So if you are, if it's raining outside and you are both warm and dry, you're inside the thermal envelope. Let's take a look at this illustration on this slide. Building shell versus thermal envelope. Okay, we've seen this slide before. We have the porch and the tuck under garage. If I'm standing in the tuck under garage, am I inside the thermal envelope? No, but I am inside the building shell, right? If I'm in the basement here, I'm both inside the thermal envelope and inside the building shell. The thermal envelope is always inside the building shell. But the building shell does not always correspond to the thermal envelope. So you can't be inside the thermal envelope and outside the building shell. It doesn't work that way. Here's some key concepts about the thermal barrier that you need to keep in mind. The thermal envelope is made up of the thermal barrier and the air barrier, right? And what, what do we know about those two things, about the thermal, em, thermal barrier and the air barrier? What do they need to be? They have to be aligned with each other, and they have to be continuous, continuous and aligned. When you look at a thermal barrier, in order for that thermal barrier to be effective, it has to be continuous, it has to have an air barrier or pressure barrier right up next to it, and it has to have a vapor barrier because we can't allow our thermal barrier to get wet. Insulation. Insulation works by slowing heat loss or heat gain. It also works by retarding convective loops, and it has to have an air barrier on all six sides, unless we're in the attic, in which case we need an air barrier on five sides. Understand this concept, okay? Let's say this wall behind me was not here, okay? If this room was filled with people, and this wall was not here, but we had rose bushes behind us. And in order to get outside, you had to crawl through the rose bushes. The more rose bushes we had, the slower people would leave this room. Right? Okay. Insulation works the same way. The thicker the insulation is, the harder it is for the heat to get through it. The more heat stays in the room for longer. Functions of insulation. Slows heat transfer, reduces temperature variation in living space. How does insulation reduce temperature variation in living space? Because the heat stays in longer and it's not escaping, right? Let's graph this out. So we have time down here, temperature over here, right? So let's just say 72 and uh, 68, okay? So we've warmed up our house to 72 degrees, and so now it's going to start to cool off. When it hits 68, we're going to warm it up again. When it hits 72, we stop warming it and so on, and so on, and so on, right? Over time. But let's say we insulate that room so we don't lose 
as much heat as fast. So now we start losing less heat as fast. Heat it back up. Heat it back up. You understand that? See how it stops the temperature, it retards the temperature fluctuations and ends up saving you a lot of money because you have fewer heating cycles. You notice we heat back up just as fast, but then we lose that heat over a longer period of time. Imagine a bucket with water in it. You poke a hole in the bottom of the bucket, and that water starts to drain out of that bucket at a particular rate. We have to keep filling that bucket up in order to keep that bucket full. If we make that hole smaller, if we let less water out of that bucket, we fill it less often. So that's what insulation does for our room. It reduces our mechanical equipment requirements. Why does it reduce our mechanical equipment requirements? If our furnace isn't kicking on as much, then we don't need as much furnace, do we? Because really, when you think about it, go back to that bucket, right? If we want to keep that bucket full and it's draining water out of the bottom, what do we really need to do? We can plug the hole, yes, okay? But what we really need to do is just put the same amount of water back in the bucket that's coming out of the bottom of the bucket, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, but that's not how we do things, right? What we do is we stand there and we watch the bucket drain water out of the bucket. And then we're going, you know what? That's getting kind of low. So then we fill it all the way back up to the top. And we watch it drain and drain and drain. That, isn't that how our HVAC system works? Okay. Yep. Yep. So we really want it 70 degrees in here. Mm -hmm. But the furnace sits there and just watches the temperature and lets the heat drain out of the room and drain out of the room. And then finally hits 68 and our thermostat says, hey, furnace, it's getting cold in here. Can we have some heat? Okay, so then the furnace kicks on, right? And we heat that room up to 72 degrees, and then we stop. And we watch the temperature drop back down and drop back down and drop back down, right? So if we make that hole in the bucket smaller, then we don't have to fill it up as often or as quickly, okay? So that's, that's the concept of reducing the amount of mechanical equipment that we need. And the same works, it's, same works the other way, right? If we can stop the heat gain, then we don't need as much air conditioner to remove the heat from the house. And then insulation prevents condensation. Prevents condensation? How does insulation prevent condensation? If our walls stay warmer, then the air next to our walls stays warmer and the relative humidity next to the walls stays lower than if our walls were uninsulated and that surface was 30 degrees or something like that. Now I want to start talking about insulation types, what kind of insulation there is. Cellulose insulation is simply recycled newspaper that's been treated to be fire resistant. It's been treated to be fire resistant, not fireproof. So that's the material. Let's talk about how we get the material installed, okay? The first type, the first method we call blown in. And that simply is we take the cellulose, we take the bag, we throw it in the hopper, it's got some things that chop it up, and then we blow it through a hose and it gets nice and fluffy as we're blowing it through the hose. It comes out of the end of the hose and you play it where it lies. It comes out of the end of the hose, drops in that spot, that's where it is, okay? 
blown in solution. Our next method of, is called loose fill. And when we loose fill something, we actually, that's what we're doing. We're filling up a cavity or something like that with insulation. Then we have dense pack, which is the same thing as loose fill, except when we dense pack, we dense pack. You look at a bag of cellulose, and that cellulose is packed in that bag. Okay? And it is the shape of that bag. You, un you take the wrapper off of it, and it's still the shape of that bag. Okay? When you dense fill, for example, a wall cavity, then that cellulose will go into that wall cavity, and it will pack into that wall cavity, and it will assume the shape of your wall cavity, which is the beauty of thing doing something like a dense pack, and we're going to talk about bibs in a minute, is that that cellulose will then conform to the shape of your wall cavity if it's a little bit wider or a little bit narrower, that's okay. Also, if you have pipes or wires running through the cavity, that's okay, because it'll fill in and around it, and you get a nice, um, well-insulated wall cavity. Then we have what's called bibs, blown-in bats. And blown in bats, this is something you do in new construction. So the, the walls are already up, the sheeting's already up, and then what we do is we come along the wall and we put basically cheesecloth along the walls. Then we poke a hole in this cheesecloth and then we do a dense pack. Okay? So instead of having, we don't call it dense pack, we call it blown in bats because when you dense pack you have two hard surfaces on both sides. When we do blown in bats, we have a hard surface on one side, and then we have this cheesecloth that we've just kind of stapled up to the, to the studs, and we fill this in, and then we take and put the sheet rockers, come and put our drywall up over the top of it. So that's blown in bats. And then our last method we're going to talk about is called spray-on. And when we do cellulose with spray-on, again, we have a new construction, so the walls are up, the sheeting is up, but there's no drywall. And so we take the cellulose and we do the same chopping it up, blowing through the hose, but at the end of the hose, we have a nozzle. And on that nozzle, we introduce just a little bit of water. Does anybody have experience with a spit wad? <laughs> Not for years. No. Okay. So when we, when we introduce a little bit of water to paper, it gets pasty and sticky, right? right? So now we can take and blow that water, or we blow the water, we blow that insulation that's got a little bit of moisture on it up onto the wall and it sticks. It sticks to the wall and it sticks to each other. So we take it and we blow it up on the wall, then somebody comes back, another tech comes by, shaves it even to the studs, and then the third tech comes by with a vacuum, vacuums up the extra, it goes through the vacuum, through a dryer, and back into the hopper. How thick is this spray-on? The spray-on is as thick as you want it. You can make, if it's two by fours, you make it four inches thick. Do you have to wait for it to dry, or do you just? No, you just, or hosing it on. You just, you just hose it on until the cavity is full, and then the tech comes oh, and slices amazing. it off. Let's talk about fiberglass. Fiberglass insulation is exactly that. It's glass spun into fibers and made into various different uh, kinds of insulation, which we're going to talk about using primarily glue and machines and that sort of thing. You'll notice when we talk about bats and blankets, we talk about fiberglass, but we don't talk about cellulose because cellulose doesn't come in bats and blankets. Okay. Uh, a fiberglass bat, everybody know what a fiberglass bat is? Okay, a fiberglass bat is basically insulation that's been formed to be a particular shape and size. Usually it's the width of uh, a stud bay, for example, and the thickness of the stud. So the width of that insulation is designed to fit in between the studs. If you're using two by four studs, it's going to be three and a half inches thick. If you're using two by six and designed to go in two by six, then it'll be five and a half inches thick, okay? And sometimes it has a moisture barrier on one side, sometimes it doesn't, 
Sometimes it's fully encapsulated, sometimes it's not. It just depends on the product. Um, high performance bats have a higher R rating than a standard bat and so on. A blanket is a four foot wide bat and comes in a roll, okay? Bats are ten, tend to be cut a certain length. They're eight feet, 10 feet, 12 feet, okay? Because they're designed to be, to, to give you convenience for installation. So if you're eight foot high walls, then you want to be able to just grab the bat, put the bat in place, and have it be the right size. So it comes in a several standard sizes. A blanket, however, is four feet wide and usually comes on a 60 foot roll. Where you would use a blanket would be to insulate a foundation in a basement area or to insulate the foundation in a crawl space area. That's our application for a blanket. And blankets, again, they come faced and unfaced. Just like with cellulose, we can do a loose fill or a blown in fiberglass, okay? And that's the same thing. We take fiberglass, uh, fiberglass fibers, we throw them in the hopper, hopper chops them up, blows them down the hose, it blows out, we play it where it lies, right? We can also do what's called a spray-on. Now, you know, if you, your, your mirror in your bathroom gets wet all the time, right? But glass that gets wet doesn't stick to itself. So in order for us to use, do a spray-on with fiberglass, we actually have to use glue, okay? So there's a company called Spider that makes this process where we can do spray-on fiberglass, okay? And it works the same way. We take the fiberglass, put the fiberglass in the hopper, it chops it up, blows it down the hose, and then at the end of the hose, we also have a nozzle. But instead of injecting water like we do with cellulose, we actually inject glue. And that glue makes the fiberglass stick to the wall, stick to each other. And then we do the same thing. We fill up the cavity. The next tech comes by, shaves it off so that's nice and even with the studs. And then the next tech comes by, vacuums it up, goes back to the hopper. It gets dried. It gets dropped back into the hopper, recycled, and away we go. So now we can also do the same thing with blown-in bats. It's the same process, right? We have sheeting, studs, and then we put up our cheesecloth, then we poke our hole in our cheesecloth, and instead of blowing cellulose in, now we're blowing fiberglass in, then we put sheet rock up over the top of it. And we're gonna talk about environmentally, more environmentally friendly options for insulation in just a minute. Some really cool options, just a second. Okay, the last one that we run into is called rock wool. Rock wool is actually metal slag. They get this from foundries and they take this waste product of slag and they spin it into fibers. And it actually has the same insulating properties of fiberglass. Typically with rock wool, we'll only see either bats or blankets. And they still make this stuff, and you'll see it in a lot of industrial applications, but not in residential applications, not new applications anymore. It's basically fiberglass out of metal, okay? It has the same insulating properties, the same sound properties, um, but it has a higher melting point. So a lot of times it'll be, they'll, they'll, they use it in industrial applications where you have um, lots of heat in the area, okay? Um, and one last thing I'll say about rock wool. When you're in a house and you're trying to identify rock wool versus fiberglass, and I say rock wool versus fiberglass, is because rock wool looks like a red or brown fiberglass, like a dark brown fiberglass. So if you're doing your test, you pull out what looks like dark brown fiberglass, that's rock wool. Fiberglass typically comes in three colors, typically, and it depends on the manufacturer. It'll either be white, pink, or yellow. Okay, yellow, John Mansfield, pink is Owens Corning, white is like everybody else.
What's more effective? Everybody knows the answer to that. It depends on the application, okay? Um, cellulose has a higher R value than fiberglass, but cellulose is more expensive than fiberglass, okay? Um, you know, it, it depends on your application, okay? Because fiberglass is um, fire resistant, right? The same way as cellulose fire resistant, but cellulose has a much lower flash point than does fiberglass, okay? So if you're using fiberglass in an area that's going to be close to a high temperature heat source, like an exhaust pipe, like an exhaust pipe for example, okay, a flue pipe, things like that. If you, when you, and you'll learn this this afternoon, if you're going to use cellulose next to a flue pipe, you actually have to collar the flue pipe, even if it's B-vent, if it's double, even a double walled um, exhaust pipe, you have to collar, you can't put cellulose within six inches of a flue pipe. Okay? Safety, safety issues, okay? What do we have to do to be safe? We have to be fully geared, right? We need to have our respirators on. We need to have glasses on. We need to have gloves on. We need to have our suit on, right? We need to be fully suited when we work with these things. Fiberglass, cellulose, I, I strongly recommend being fully suited with cellulose when you work with cellulose. Um, I do know some folks who aren't, um, but that, that would be my recommendation for safety. Are we a new construction? Are we an existing construction? Are we talking about uh, what is a preference of the homeowner? What are the economics? Okay, how much more expensive is fiberglass over the cellulose? Okay, um, who's doing the work? You know, it's, it, it, it depends on all of those, of those factors. Is the homeowner willing to pay the extra money or are we just trying to throw up as many houses as we possibly can, right? If you're looking at track houses, you won't find cellulose in track houses because fiberglass is cheaper, right? If you're looking at a custom home, you're probably going to be looking at blown-in cellulose in uh, blown-in bats with cellulose. Unless the homeowner is like, well, you know, I'm building this 10,000 square foot house. I want to spend the money on granite countertops, not on insulation. And consequently, you're going to see fiberglass bats, right? So it really depends on a lot of different things depending on what you're going to, what you're going to see. If I'm a contractor, I want to fill up the wall cavity as inexpensively as I possibly can. So I want a, if the, if code calls for R11 in the wall, I want a three and a half inch bat that is R11. Not R12, not R19. I want it to be R11 because that's going to be the least expensive option for me. Okay, that's, I mean, uh, it's a sad, it's the sad answer, right? But that's what's true. I don't want to take a high density bat that's R11, but it's only two and a half inches thick. Because if I put a two and a half inch thick bat in a three and a half inch cavity, I've rendered it useless. Right? Because I've, I've made space for a convective loop, right? I'm sorry, that's just the cold, hard facts of it, right? It's about the economics. I keep coming back to that it depends because I want you to stay flexible in your mind, understanding that you're going to go to a customer and one customer is going to have lots of money to spend, is going to be really, really cooperative with you, is going to be your dream customer. And you're going to go to another customer and they're not going to have hardly any money to spend, right? But they are just as valid a customer, they're just as valid a consumer, okay? So you say, cellulose is the way to go. And they say, I can't afford it, okay? Well, the next best thing is fiberglass, right? So we don't wanna keep hammering on them saying, you gotta have cellulose, you gotta have cellulose. All they're gonna do is kick you out of the door.
because you're not helping them at all, right? So just keep those, don't, don't never forget about the economics. If you see fiberglass bats in an attic, okay, more than likely that was a homeowner at some point trying to insulate their attic, okay? So let's say you run into a homeowner and the homeowner's like, I don't have enough money to pay for somebody to do this. What do you think? Should I just go down to Home Depot and grab some more bats and just roll some more bats out here? Say no, because they can go down to Home Depot and rent an insulating machine, okay? And then they can buy, if they can afford it, they can buy um, bags of cellulose. If they can't afford the bags of cellulose, they can buy the bags of fiberglass and blow that insulation over the top of their, over the top of their insulating ba bats or the rolls or whatever so that you get a nice even seal. And explain that to them, right? And here's the thing. Most of the time, if you buy enough insulation, the company that you're buying the insulation from will give you the machine to use. You buy six bags, get the blowing machine for free. 20, bags or 30. 20 or 30 bags or whatever. Okay? So, so, you know, keep that in mind. I mean, don't, uh, and, and if they're, you know, at the, you, you give them the facts, they decide what they want to do about it, right? So just, you know, tell them, you know, this is not a good option. This is why, it, you know, they'll get it, okay? They'll get it. Let's go on to some other types of, of insulation. We have spray foams. We have rigid foams. We have both expanded and extruded. Basically, when we talk about rigid foams, those are those big foam boards that you buy. They're various different thicknesses. You can get them at a number of different insulation supply houses and so on. Okay. And we take those, and those, those foam boards are made two different ways. We either take a form and we expand the foam inside the form until it is the right size. Okay, that's expanded. Or we extrude it. We take foam that's already been expanded and then we shape it into the, the shape we want it. Um, and then, of course, we have vermiculite and asbestos. Okay, these are our other two and we don't really use these things anymore, but we might run across them. Let's talk about denim bats. Denim. Hey, that's pretty cool. Ralph Lauren. Ralph Lauren bat. Now, what I really love about this particular photo, if you look at this guy installing denim bats, right? Now, that's the way I want to go to work. In shorts. Yeah, that's right. He went golfing this morning came back home, installed some denim bats, okay? It, denim bats, the same thing. The denim's been treated with a, uh, a chemical that makes it fire resistant, you know, and we've put it together in glues just like um, fiberglass, and we've created these bats. And interestingly enough, the denim bat in a four, two by four wall is about an R13, okay? So that's a little bit better than fiberglass because a fiberglass bat is going to be about 3.2 per inch. Certainly more expensive, yes, than, than fiberglass or even cellulose, but environmentally friendly. When it comes to insulation, especially when we're doing calculations for um, SIR, when it comes to insulation and things like this, we say it has a 20-year life. It might last longer, but we say it has a 20-year life. So you could easily say that a denim bat would have a 20-year life. No. Let's take a couple of looks at, uh, we looking at fiberglass, how does this spray-on system works, right? Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the guy in the red shirt, he's actually sh spraying um, cellulose over the top of uh, fiberglass bats, mm -hmm. okay? And so that's a good example of spray of uh, a blown-in fiberglass, mm -hmm. okay? If we look at the smaller picture, this guy, you can actually see the metal tip. He's actually doing spray on. Okay, so that metal tip is injecting water into the, into the cellulose insulation, 
and as you can see it's sticking to the wall and somebody's going to come by and shave that off as he moves further down and then somebody else will come and vacuum that up and dry it. Um, rigid foam, here's a good application for rigid foam. Remember we were talking about the rim joist. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we look up at the top of this slide, we see right above his head, we see an empty rim joist. Okay. Not only is that leaking air, but it's also leaking heat because that one, that two by is not providing much thermal resistance to the heat that's in this basement. So we put up, uh, we cut the rigid foam to be the right size, put it in that hole, and then we'll foam or caulk around the edge to give us a nice good air seal. Even when you put blue board on the outside, you also put insulation in the walls right. behind it, right? This is basically the insulation in the wall, right? That, uh, that provides that additional thermal resistance. We think about the picture of our folks and the, the guy in the, de the denim bats, putting the denim bats in, versus this gentleman, okay? Or maybe it's a lady, we don't know, right? They're geared up, aren't they? Okay, they got all the PPE on. And if you look at this respirator, this is not a air purifying respirator. This is actually a supplied air respirator. This spray foam, very, very good. Very, um, it has, you know, insulating properties of upwards of seven per inch, R7 per inch, okay? But here we go, here's the facts, right? When I was working weatherization, we came in, we spray foamed a house, all the rim joists, okay? Our requirement is that the homeowner had to move out for two days. Okay? You're not allowed to live in this house for two days till two days after we do this work. Because of the fumes, right? This is also an oil based product. So, works really well, is excellingly toxic. You can see that there's some trade offs with these options. In order to do this in an attic, it's got to have a coating on this side that prevents the ignition of the foam. Why would you use spray foam? That's a great question. And the answer is R7 per inch. Okay, that's a lot. So now you're, you're in a custom home. You have 2 by 10 cathedral ceiling. Okay. You're not going to get R40 in 10 inches using cellulose or fiberglass. But what if you used spray foam at R70 per inch? I mean R7 per inch. Okay? You're talking about R65, aren't you? If you fill up that whole 10 inches with spray foam? That's why. That's why you want to use spray foam. Spray foam has a very specific application. The more heating degree days you have, the more insulation you need. So consequently, spray foam starts to make sense. All right, so here's some, some examples of how dense pack cellulose get, gets done. We see in this particular application that these technicians have come in from the outside to do this work. They've taken siding off, they've drilled holes in the, in the side of siding. You see that hose that goes in, and then the insulation runs through that hose, and they do a dense pack through that hose. If you are dealing with a homeowner who doesn't have any insulation in their walls, but they're talking about putting new siding up, right? Tell them, pull the old siding down, get the insulating guys to come out and insulate, and then put the new siding up. It's perfect, right? Because then all the hole, the holes goes through the sheeting, right? So not all, not, and you can do a couple of things. You can fill those cavities up with insulation, and then you can come and put foam board along the outside, and then put the, put the, the uh, siding up. That gives you a higher R value, right? You can get to almost R19 doing it that way. Let's shift gears and start talking about R value. R value, simply put, is the resistance a material has to heat transfer. How sharp are the 
um, thorns on those rose bushes. And this is the way it works. Okay, every material has a range, an R value range. And that R value range depends on a couple of things. It depends on the quality of the installation as well as the um, quality of the material itself. Okay, so when we say fiberglass bats have an R value of 2.6 to 4.2 per inch, okay, a 4.2 is going to be a really high performance bat. A 2.6 is going to be a standard bat that maybe has been installed poorly. But in general, we're going to go right toward the center. So we're going to go right toward about 3.2 per inch. If we look at five and a half inches of fiberglass bat, that's going to be about an R19. So how do we do this? We simply multiply the R value per inch by the thickness of the material. It's that simple. When we look at our values of multiple wall components, we can actually add those R values together. If this, the sheeting is one R value, the, the siding is an R value, the sheeting is an R value, the insulation is an R value, and the um, drywall has an R value, we can take all those R values, add them together, and get a composite R value for that wall assembly. Now you try it. In your book, I want you to first find, we're going to um, find the R value of an attic space, three and a half inches of old fiberglass bats. We're going to use 2.6 per inch. So in your book, please do this calculation and write your answer. We have three and a half inches of fiberglass at 2.6 per inch. What's that? That's an R9. Okay. So now, we're going to take and add five and a half inches of fiberglass, brand new fiberglass, at a rate of 3.2 per inch. We're going to take five and a half, multiply it by 3.2, and what do we get? R17. So let's get a little bit more complicated with this. We plan to add five inches of bone fiberglass to 3.5 inches of existing fiberglass. What is the total R value? So our new fiberglass is going to be 3.5 or 3.2 per inch. And our old fiberglass, because it's old, we're going to use 2.6 per inch. What is the total R value? An R value of 16. Three and a half inches of old fiberglass at 2.6 gives us R9, then what do we do? We add them together and we get R25, right? Yes. Fantastic. Do you, see, you guys see how this works? Let's talk about our, our, our wall assembly. Remember I said we could add our, our values together? Okay, so if we have siding that has a R value of 0.8, we have plywood sheeting that has an R value of 0.63, we have three and a half inches of fiberglass bat, which is an R11, we have a half inches of drywall, which is R.45. What is the R value, total R value of this wall assembly? 12.88, right? Because we simply add all those R values together. Something that comes up often is, okay, now we understand R values and all the different insulation values and everything else. What is the common R value? I mean, what, what should we be shooting at when we get out there? When we're in the attic, in this particular climate, we should be shooting for an R value of 38. Ideally, we would like our walls to be R19. But in order to get R19 walls, we have to have 2 by 6 construction. Typically, we're going to see something closer to an R11 or an R13. Okay, when we talk about knee walls, in knee walls, we want to go with R13, at least. And we can, handle, we can handle knee walls in a couple of different ways. Okay? We can put uh, R11 bat in the knee wall, which is usually 2 by 4 construction, and then we can wrap the knee wall with a blanket. Okay? A, a blanket that has an air barrier on the surface of one side. 
or we can put our 13 bats in the knee wall and then put an air barrier like plastic or something over the top of the knee wall so that we get, you get an air barrier on all six sides of our knee wall. Because typically a knee wall is only going to have an air barrier on one side. Basements. Basements, again, basements and crawl spaces, this is where we're going to take our insulating blanket, and we want that insulating blanket to be at least an R11. Let's talk about evaluating our thermal envelope for just a second, okay? So when we're going around our building and we're looking at our thermal envelope, we're inspecting our thermal envelope, we want to identify the type of insulation that's in the walls and in the attic and in the basement. We want to identify the thickness of that material because that'll tell us what the total R value is. We want to pay attention to its condition because if it's poorly installed or it's been poorly maintained, it's wet, it's crushed, it's been removed, it's got a big hole in it, okay? All of those factors for condition we're going to uh, um, influence how we deregulate that insulation, okay? Also, we want to look at the quality of the insulation, quality insulation and quality of the install. All of those things are going to contribute to whether or not we are going to deregulate that piece, that insulation value or not. Are we going to go with 3.2 or are we going to go with 2.6 based on the condition of the insulation? Now let's talk about U-value. U-value is a measurement of transmittance. Now, R value was a measurement of resistance, but U value is a measurement of transmittance. And simply put, U value is the reciprocal of R value, and R value is the reciprocal of U value. It's that simple. Okay? If you have R value and you need U value, you take the R value and divide it into one. If you have U value and you need R value, take the U value and divide it into one, okay? One of the things that you're gonna wanna put in your notes is this simple triangle. If we have um, R value and we want U value, if we have U value and we want R value, one over U, see how that triangle works? There's something interesting about U value and R value. What can we do with R values? We can add R values together, but we can't add U values together. We can, however, average U values, but we can't average R values. Why do we care? Why do I make that distinction? What's the big deal? Imagine this particular scenario. Let's say we go to a home, and in that home, we look at phase one Actually, we look at the whole house, and over the top of the entire house, we notice there's R9 of insulation. But on two-thirds of that house is additional R10 of insulation. And then on the last third is R19. What is the R value of this attic? Right? Do you see the challenge, right? Yeah. Some people say this, some people say that, some people say this. Okay, right? Now, if we were to just simply take the R values, let's say, okay? So we have uh, R9, what is in essence R19, right? And then we have R38, right? Because this is, this is R9. This is R19, that's R38, right? Let's just add them up. We get 56, right? And then divided by 3, 18.6. Okay, let's just say 18.6, okay? All right, is that right? What do we say we can't do with our values? We can't average them, right? Okay, so... We know that we can't average our, our values, so we know that this is wrong, okay? But we know we can average U values, right? We can average U values? Okay, so let's try that. What's the U value of R9? 
Point one. Okay. So what is the U value of R19? What's the U value of R38? 0.03. Okay. So let's look at the average. 0.18. 0.18, okay, so we have 0.18, we divide that by 3, 0.18 divided by 3, 0.06u, okay, that's the average u value, with me so far? Okay, now, let's turn that u value back into an r value, 1 divided by 0.06 is 16... 0.5, right? So now we say that the, R, the, the average R value of this attic is 16.5. Now we can take that 16.5 and turn it back into a U value, right, which is 0.06, and plug it into our heat loss calculation, and that'll tell us what our heat loss is, okay? But there's something else I want you to pay attention to here, okay? One third, actually two thirds of our attic is R19 or above. Two thirds. What's our average R, our average R value? 16.5. That means that R9 will make R38 act more like itself, then R38 will make R9 make it act like itself. Okay? So here's something else that this, this should tell you. That when you run across a hole in attic insulation, for example, you have an attic that's well insulated, let's say it's R38, but there's no insulation above an attic hatch. There's a big well where they've installed a, a can light or something like that, right? Big hole, they dug the insulation away. Those spots have a huge degrading effect on the insulation in an attic. And in a wall, too, right? We fill the wall up with R11, and then we have a big sag at the top that's basically R1. Okay, not only is that going to degrade the, re the insulation, but it's also at the top where all the heat is to begin with. Right? So this, this exercise is twofold. It allows you to kind of see how um, R and U values interact with each other, but it's also designed to show you that when you have a hole in your insulation, when you have a low spot in the insulation, that the whole attic is going to act like that low spot. Right? So that's why when we measure, when we go up in our attic and we measure, we, are me we find the low spot we measure at that spot, and that's what we call a whole attic. So in a lot of cases, especially when you have a homeowner who's got these holes and stuff, they're better off to go up into the attic and rake out their insulation and make it all nice and even. Okay? So that's some of our recommendations that we want to do.